Thank you, Jamal. Uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratan, President SLMA, co-chairs for the session, Dr. Mahesh Raju Surya and Dr. Jamal De Silva. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I think you know the procedure of this workshop. So we'll start with a, a recorded scenario first, and then let's get back to the discussion. While we sort that out, I would like to add one point to what Dr. Jamal was saying a few minutes back. Uh, you know, up to 80% of successful tobacco quitters never seek any sort of help, uh, any sort of help. They just do it on their own. So we need to be aware of this large proportion of people who get rid of their substance use habits without um, seeking medical advice. Uh, so we, I mean, the more they uh, do that, that's good because they are, you know, self-efficacious and they are doing it on their own and uh, without expert input. So never underestimate that, never undermine that. Thank you. Right. So that's part of a conversation between a doctor and a patient about substance use, mainly about alcohol. And uh, you can see this patient is a very supportive kind of patient. Sometimes you might not see patients like this very often. But uh, what I wanted to highlight is that this conversation took nearly two to three minutes. And uh, sometimes 
there are many patients who are coming not only for substance use related problems, but for other health problems as well. But you know, you can see similar kind of myths coming out. So the focus of this presentation is to make you aware of how to address the industry influences in our therapeutic approach. So now as medical officers, especially who in the clinical sector, clinical setting or private practice, apart from the diseases caused by various substances and also the treatment approaches, there are many things that you need to know, especially in order to address substance use related practices of your patients. So one driving force is that the common beliefs spread by various industries, especially when it comes to the legal substances like alcohol and tobacco. The myths are enormous and they use various ways of infiltrating even the medical world. So exploring these influences of industry is very important and you should know how to explore these myths in your uh, medical conversations. So if you try to identify some common influences or common impressions created by industry, you can see topics like this. You know, people are talking about health benefits of alcohol. This very example was trying to identify one uh, uh, aspect of it. And then the medicinal value of cannabis, I think Dr. Medani addressed it very well. And alcohol and pleasure, even among the doctors, we see, you know, this belief of the so-called perception is very common. And alcohol and violence, there's a norm in society and also the sexual desire performance and the relationship between various substances. And there are many more beliefs. So let's try to identify how these beliefs are created and what exactly the scientific background behind the, the, the reality. Now, let me first focus on the health benefits of alcohol. Now, the health benefits of alcohol, especially the risk of coronary heart disease has a long history. Now, a lot of medical doctors are also prescribing, you know, in inverted commas, or advising their patients to initiate alcohol in order to cut down the ischemic heart disease risk because of these myths around. Now, at present, what we know, whether alcohol consumption lowers the ischemic heart disease risk or what exactly happened. Now the popular J-shaped curve. Now we know the reality behind the J-shaped curve is that due to a confounding effect of selection of the populations for these studies. The zero alcohol users who selected for this particular study were not the healthiest group in that community, which confounded the results of this J-shaped curve. And for years, we believed that a little bit of alcohol is good for the heart. And what about the safe limit, whether it's safe or no safe? To understand that, I would like to share some two important research findings, where one says that alcohol, even in very small quantities, is known to cause certain types of cancer. And this published in uh, Lancet very recently, so all of you can access this article and then you'll find out. So they say, we found that the risk of all cause mortality and of cancers specifically raises with the increasing levels of consumption. And this is the most important part that I want you to keep in mind. The level of consumption that minimizes the health loss is zero. And this particular study, popularly known as the Biobank study in UK. So according to that study, they say no safe dose of alcohol for the brain was found. And the moderate consumption is associated with more widespread adverse effects on the brain than previously recognized, right? So they also suggest that guidelines should be revised to take into account all these brain effects. So it's not about alcohol. There are a lot of myths created by these industries, but what the research says is totally opposite. Cannabinoids and the relationship between cancer, 
then high potency cannabis tested 50% of new psychosis cases that is the relationship between various psychosis and cannabis use. And what is the history of promoting these medical myths? Now, this is from an advertisement of tobacco industry more than 60 years ago. You can see how they have promoted tobacco targeting expectant mothers. And uh, according to evidence, no one has protested because at that time we didn't have enough evidence to uh, resist these kind of advertisements. And because we didn't have evidence during that time, they were targeting doctors as well. And they used doctors to say that more doctors smoke this particular brand of cigarettes. And they have new scientific evidence on effects of smoking, on various positive effects of smoking due to uh, on your health. And the next point that I want to highlight here is that most of the time, our patients, they might come and tell you, you know, why I use it? Because I enjoy it. The relationship between the happiness between various substances. And this is very common for alcohol, alcohol and happiness. Now, what is the effect of alcohol in happiness? So this is kind of less examine impact that we usually see in our clinical practice. When they will come and say, you know, I enjoy doctor, I enjoy alcohol. Okay, but you know, you have to cut down. So sometimes you also agree that it is enjoyable. And then they say, even though it's enjoyable, you have to cut it down. So then the patient goes with a, you know, uh, a doubt. Because of that, it goes unnoticed due to various shared beliefs. The society believes it, then sometimes the medical world believes it. Now, if you really examine the relationship between happiness and alcohol, now what they really enjoy, this something different story will come out. Now the dependent people, the people who are really dependent on alcohol, when they consume it, then you find it rewarding because it relieves the withdrawal discomfort sometime. That is not the right way of relieving withdrawal symptoms. But they feel it's rewarding because they can get rid of the withdrawal symptoms. So, so they think that they have to continue it. Or sometimes they perceive wrongly that they enjoy it. And also some individuals, they might see it's you know, enjoyable, enjoyable because of they can get freedom from their responsibilities. And also most people, especially the people in the public, they see this uh, relationship or they feel it cool or cozy or whatever because of this con conditioning of a continued use. Whenever you use it, so most of the time you use it in the uh, enjoyable environments. So you think that, you know, that joy is created by alcohol because of this conditioning, you think alcohol is enjoyable. So it's actually the social context and the expectation that brings you the happiness. It's not the chemical effect of alcohol. So in treatment, it's very important for doctors to help your patients to improve the happiness genuinely and it's beneficial in our treatment as well. So your patients are exposed to various influences from the industry where ultimately they believe that alcohol is happiness. Whatever my doctor says, ultimately it's happy. It, it brings you happiness, joy, pleasure. So you need to know how the industry play this game and use the very same examples to uh, address these myths. Now, let's see whether I can play this. Hammers at the end of a mini party, a quaubem, y'all want a beer dinner. Would there a John Blake in Dungal and Wheel Legat? Would there a Kilbatica Gabu than cutting candy rice? A pay Paul again, Angita toilet in. So these are the new technologies they use to target young people and, you know, general advice from doctors, don't drink, it's not good, it's bad, may not be very effective when you see the methods the industry is using to promote the myths, beliefs, and wrong perceptions. And addressing behaviors, right? So some drug-related problems are due to drug-induced behaviors because this behavior is socially excused. So if your client is violent or aggressive, 
it may not be directly due to the direct chemical effect of alcohol. So we have to keep in mind that quitting substance use or quitting alcohol, quitting whatever the substance, not essential to change the negative behavior. So there are many ways of addressing this behavior because behavior is modulated by various other factors. So as doctors, it's important for you to explore the influences of these industries. So this depends on your knowledge, your interest, and your confidence. I'm happy that I can see that a lot of doctors now do this kind of research. So the way you ask some questions, the type of questions you ask today shows that you have gone into that level to understand how the industry is operating and propagating these ideas. And all of us, we should try to look into this and address it. And always check on myths and perceptions about substances and give an effective response in order to uh, comprehensively address the treatment part of it. So finally, let me give you some ideas about things that you can do as a practitioner, a general practitioner or in doctor. So you can do interventions with users. So I'm not going to touch on that. Most of our colleagues have done that. Now changing your environment, if you are working in a hospital, hospital environment, your home, the home of uh, uh, the wider community. So ch doing changes in these settings also supportive of uh, treatment as well. And finally, the policy measures. A lot of doctors, now the doctors in Sri Lanka Medical Association, expert committee on tobacco and alcohol, tirelessly worked for many years to strengthen the policies like National Authority on Tobacco and Alcohol and pictorial warnings on health images and also the, the recent alcohol policy of Sri Lanka. So these policies are also helpful in helping your uh, patients, clients to quit substance use. And finally, think about your own use as well, because there are many things coming in handy to promote substance use among various groups. Now, if you are a doctor and you use alcohol at this moment, so what are the things that you should consider? One is that treat this just as a drink, right? Don't promote it as something that is going to give you millions of things. Reduce as much as possible because the alcohol related harm is dose dependent, right? Even the zero is the most safest level, but if you can reduce, the harm is also reduced. Avoid hazards and high risks. Do not glamorize and avoid spreading myths. I have seen this doing by doctors in the Facebook very often and in sometimes in social gatherings saying that ah, during our medical student days, this is how we enjoyed it now that scenario. Do not promote others to drink or to drink more than they wish. And avoid victimization of others after using alcohol. Finally, what is the role of medical practitioner? Intervene in all circumstances. Record and analyze your successes and failures and that is important for you to improve further. And also these things can be shared with the doctors in this room as well. Get those who quit reduced use to disseminate their success because that is important for other people to realize how they have overcome all these challenges. And persuade other doctors to emulate your success. So that is one idea of this workshop as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. So that brings us to the discussion. If you have any questions, you can unmute your mics and uh, start asking questions. There must be questions and comments uh, after those powerful messages. <laughs> uh, so don't feel bad to if you want to challenge or anything. Please go ahead and unmute your mics and speak up. The mic, can you please repeat in the mic? There must be a culture for, I mean, a sort of a big role to play, you know, because in our culture for women to not to drink and men to drink. 
Yes, madam. So there are many determinants. So one is that the culture created within the society and part of this culture is also manipulated by the industry as well. So initially they introduced it as something that, you know, the men only can drink. That is how they promoted for men. And now they are also targeting women as well. So if you want to, you know, become equal in the society like men, you should take it up. So all sort of influences are there. I think cultural influences are definitely there. Uh, um, since we are not scholars of cultural studies, perhaps we are not the best person to uh, persons to answer that. But yes, definitely, um, alcohol consumption is world over, less in females than in males. My personal belief is that uh, females are more, you know, mature <laughs> and brainy <laughs> and responsible <laughs> than the average man. That's, I mean, they are evolutionarily more uh, adaptive than men, I think. Look at the wars started by men and look at the wars started by women and compare the numbers, right? Um, anyway, that's my personal view. Uh, but, but the tobacco industry or the alcohol industry never hesitate to change culture when they want. The excellent example is the torches, torch of freedom. The, uh, smoking was almost absent among women in the USA, and they started this campaign to rebrand uh, rebrand cigarettes as the torch of freedom. So you are a downtrodden, you are you know restricted to home. Come out, walk on the street with a cigarette in your lips, and that was a planned uh, campaign, and it worked. And the smoking rates in females uh, shot up in uh, the US. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Uh, don't you think that we should stop serving alcohol at SLMA events and making it glamorous? So if I want to answer that question, my, my suggestion is yes, because, uh, because as doctors, we have to show the world as doctors what we really believe and what kind of science that we believe. But uh, there are a lot of forces, uh, challenges that the SLMA has to face when you try to do that. Because for years, the industry is keeping an eye on various sectors. One is the medical sector, right? And there are a lot of other sectors as well because they know if the medical sector is, you know, they, they try to address this effectively and the results are enormous. The best example is in Sri Lanka. You know, the battle against the tobacco industry is actually, you know, there were many groups involved in it, but the backbone was the medical world. A lot of policies and various uh, other interventions like pictorial health warnings. So SLMA played a pivotal role in that. And even the uh, the present, you know, the present history, the, the, the history that we are aware of. SLMA played a huge role in addressing or influencing various uh, people advocacy. It worked really well because when it comes from Sri Lanka Medical Association, it was a very powerful message. So yes, I do agree on that, but I think uh, someone can answer about the decision. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, yes, I think it's important that we discuss. Uh, I, I do agree, but then it has to come up as a policy level. It's not as yes. individual level. Yes, so of I course. think that uh, maybe the expert committee on tobacco, alcohol, and illicit drugs could bring on that right. proposal at the AGA, right? So that uh, it is agreed by you all. And as an association, it would be very convenient for all concerned because that is a policy decision. Yeah, that's right. I think that's a brilliant way to address it. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think uh, it's up to now, Jamal as the convener of the <laughs> expert committee. Uh, and uh, as a national policy, that is the case. Uh, uh, Dr. Latika Thaud had uh, informed us, uh, to my knowledge, not serving alcohol at social events organized by the health sector is a part of the national alcohol policy of 2016, and we should. So we can quote that and you know, suggest a resolution. And, and Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists have passed a resolution not to serve alcohol in any of their uh, professional activities. 
Uh, this is this is not an approach to try and make the entire Sri Lanka tea totalist. Definitely. This just let's not promote. That's the That's only right. message. Yes. You can unmute your mics if you want to um, say anything, or we can move on to the next. Yeah, just to add a little bit more, um, going without alcohol in public events as doctors is not just a moral stand or ethical principle. That is based on science as well. Right? So one of the approaches which we can take up is to uh, take out alcohol from public events, which will reduce the overall consumption in the community. And that will lead to the uh, prevention aspect of alcohol related problems. So there is a science behind that. And, and on that, we will be giving less chance of glamorizing and promoting alcohol as well within the event and outside the event. So this is based on science. And then it brings us to the discussion of the right of the individual. Some people might ask, okay, if I'm an adult and if I can buy this, this is uh, available. Well, of course, we can allow that as well. If this is an individual, right? Buy your own alcohol and drink and come or come and drink, whatever, that's fine. Mm. But the policy should be a different one and it should be public health oriented because we are primarily a public health or we are responsible for the health of the country. We are not just a professional organization working for ourselves. So we have a responsibility and this is a, a suggestion which we can take up at various forums at different levels, including hospital organized clinical uh, session events to colleges and to the SLMA and even beyond that. So adding that, uh, I would like to thank you Dr. Manoj uh, for coming up with a wonderful presentation. Uh, Manoj is an expert in health promotion as well. He added the component of improving our own happiness, whether we use substance or not. We can do it without substances a lot. And that is uh, the that is what is being shown with science. When we are free of substances, we are much, much more happier. Thank you, Manoj. Thank so you. We can go to the next uh, presentation. Dr. Mahesh will introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, congratulations rolling in for the decision that is made just now.